Welcome everyone to your FX and crypto midweek for June 14th. Corey here with you. And really today is Fed Day. We're going to talk about the FOMC meeting, prep for that, trade it live, have a lot of fun here together. So I'm just going to come over and go live for a minute. We're going to start with market uh, movement and, and price action in just a minute, but we're going to start with the FOMC. So the actual statement comes out in about 30 minutes, 2 p.m. Eastern time. The Fed is expected to keep rates unchanged. So the Fed funds rate is 5.25. It's expected to stay there. If we look at a chart of the Fed funds, and this is something that I always emphasize, that when you think about price action, things go on trends, right? So trends meaning that it will trend, they're in a rate hiking cycle trend, they're in a rate cutting cycle trend, they're in a rate pausing, and now they're in a rate hiking cycle. So the question is ultimately, where's the peak on this? Are they going to now move into a pause for a while? Are they just going to pause for one meeting and then start raising just a little bit more? You know, those are the debates, those are the question marks, and here's the reality. The reality is, is 25 basis points one way or the other doesn't really matter that much. It's not as though the market's going to be super strong if we're if our Fed funds is at 5.25, but if they go to 5.5, oh, that's a disaster and we'll go into a recession. You know, it's not that 0.25 matters. That it's not that dramatic of a difference. It's more about the expectations that the market has for where rates are going, and then just sort of where rates are overall. So we've certainly seen a huge increase in just rates in general, right? We went from a zero interest rate policy to a very real interest rate policy. Now, that has an effect. Now, there's lag effects, but it has an effect everywhere because mortgages are now more expensive. All of these things that cost money to borrow money and so forth it it really has a significance and so when you look at this in terms of does it matter so much whether we're 25 basis points this way that way probably not but it's more about where are we at big picture where are we going and that's the problem for markets the markets as i see it are expecting the fed to start going into a rate cutting cycle in fact they're pricing that in for later this year. Well, the only way the Fed is going to start to cut rates is if something really goes wrong. If the if, if things are kind of going as planned, the Fed has no interest in cutting dramatically because they're still very nervous about inflation. And remember, they got inflation dead wrong. They're the golfer that hit the ball in the water, and now they got to hit the same shot. And they have to err on hitting it too far because they can't afford to dump another one in the water and underestimate the yardage and so forth. And that's what the Fed did. They underestimated inflation. So they're going to keep rates higher for longer to battle that out. Now, when you look at the Fed meeting, there's really been a pop and drop or a drop and pop scenario that's been playing out for a very long time. You have the statement, and then you have the press conference. And what you're seeing is, is that every reaction that comes from this seems to be offset when this happens. If the market rallies and goes up on the announcement, then the Fed chair tries to talk it back down, and those gains are gone. And so it doesn't matter which way you go, whether the market goes up, it probably give back, it goes down or probably bounce back. That's what we've been seeing. That's been the common dynamic. And that's frustrating if you're trading, you know, any market because there's no follow through. That's been the case for a very long time. Now, there's probably a reasoning for that. When you think about the Fed, the the statement comes out, but then Fed Chair Powell starts to speak and he kind of tries to walk back. Because they don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. So he tries to walk back if the market seems to be reacting too much to something. So if they hint that they're going to pause, well, then he's still going to, during his press conference, say, but 
you know, while we paused at this meeting, we may hike again because we're still concerned, you know, and so whatever they say, he tries to walk it back. If the market takes it as a negative, well, we don't, you know, da, 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 and tries to walk it back. And so you're seeing a lot of that between 2 to 2.30. There's a move from 2 to 2.30 and then almost the opposite move at 2.30 once he begins speaking. Now, it's not right at 2.30. It's usually at like 2.40, 2.50. It's somewhere along there. He says something to walk back what was being priced in and then away those those gains or losses go. And we've seen that in FX. It's a pop and drop. It's a fading of the reaction. So I don't know if that's going to be the case here, but frankly, there's not really any reason to bet that it'll be any different this time, I suppose. We've been seeing that trend playing out. We probably have to anticipate that that's what we're going to see here uh, for for now, for the foreseeable future. So let's come in and we'll look at a few different charts and we'll get prepped for this. Obviously, we want to start with the U.S. dollar pairing. And I do have to start this class by saying that I, I was wrong on a couple of different things um, of late. And that's unfortunate because I had I've been having a stellar 2023 and things have been going really well in terms of outlooks and so on. Well, the market seems to be diverging a little bit here on this last little bit. So in the U.S. dollar chart, I got stopped out because I really anticipated that this pullback, first of all, we called for a pullback here. That was a good call because we certainly backed up. Then I thought that as we came in here, especially on that candle, I thought, okay, this is where it should start to, to turn back up. And this is where we should find support and so on. It looked very good. Cup and handle, ascending triangle, whatever. But trends don't always work. And, uh, you know, setups don't always pan out. And that's what happened here. This was the deal breaker. And this was, I mean, essentially, you just have to bail out. You have to exit the thesis. And so I was wrong about the dollar from the standpoint of anticipating that it could work its way higher. Now, it's really strange that as the dollar fell, you didn't see some big reaction from gold or Bitcoin or other things. And some of the other currencies didn't trade really well either. So you look at something like the euro, it's still down over the past week or so. So US dollar and euro both kind of sliding to the downside. Japanese yen still sliding to the downside. We're certainly seeing the, the final phases of that market equity rally. And again, I'd even say in terms of equities. Now, I, I wasn't convinced that I had picked the top or anything like that. I even said, uh, as far as where we go in the short term, it's kind of 50-50. I don't know. But I certainly expect on that intermediate basis that we're going to have some give back. That what tends to happen in this type of circumstance is that you go back to where there was a base. So this frothiness should go away rather quickly. So I suspect, I still anticipate that the market's going to go down and give back that last portion of the gain rapidly. But the question is when it starts. And I think we're close, but as I said last week, I don't know that today's the day. I did have a thesis that it could happen right at the CPI. Now, the CPI, and this might still play out, I thought, and, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, that the market top could basically be very timed up. This CPI came out yesterday. So is that where the market top is? Did I, you know, run into that one? I would call that more luck than skill if it happens to be right at this this area. But it made sense to me that equities would keep going higher, pricing in the huge drop in inflation. Now, as we've talked about, we knew this was coming. This is not a surprise. The professionals knew that the CPI was going to have a massive drop, almost a 1% drop. How did we know that? Well, it's not magic, my friends. It's just looking at the month-over-month -month numbers. We knew we were getting rid of a 1% uh, 
number from June of last year and going to be putting in a much lower inflation number. Now, we didn't know if it would come in at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, but the point is, is that it was going to drop by 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Well, it dropped by 0.9. So that's a big drop in your annual CPI, and that's what the markets are pricing in. Now, next month could be an even bigger drop because in July of last year, we had a month-over-month -month print of 1.3%. If we put in another 0.1, that's going to be a 1.2% drop that all of a sudden gets you back into the twos. I think the top, though, should happen more at the June number. That was my thesis. Do, does the market keep rallying all the way into that July big CPI drop? I don't think so. I I suspect, well, I mean, it could happen, but... I suspect we're we're getting close to the high, and my best guesstimate was, again, that it could be correlated and timed up with that CPI number, which happened to come out, again, yesterday. So if this is where the market tops, right at that CPI, this Fed meeting, that wouldn't be that shocking because when do markets top out in an exhaustion on some really good news? And this is quote-unquote really good news, right? If you want to label it as good or bad, the market, you know, the public sees it as good. And I don't look at it that way, as we always talk about. It's just news. Whether it's good or bad, well, a lot of times your quote unquote good news is already priced in. So it's actually, in fact, very bad news for the market because it's where markets stop going higher, right? So uh, markets tend to create peaks at, on good news, and that CPI could be just the thing. So we'll see if that plays out. But uh, right now, again, we've continued to rally in equities up to that. So there's the QQQ. Let's go through a few more of these charts. So here's the Swiss franc. And again, a little bit more of a downward trend. You could argue it's just kind of a standard little correction at this point. British pound, still upward climbing like we've talked about. CAD, the best of the risk on currencies, but now pulling back to this old breakout zone. Not surprising there. Kind of an exhaustion high reversal up there. Aussie, big run. We touched on this, that the Aussie really had its most convincing breakout since this began because all of these you know you try to break above the moving averages and fail and you try to pierce and you try to get above and you ultimately fail this one was able to clear that and you can also see just better things happening curling up underneath now i still wouldn't chase the strength but maybe on dips you'd have to consider whether you think aussie can continue to work its way higher really probably depends on the risk on risk off scenario Kiwi, which was the worst, what, what was bad becomes good, what was good becomes bad, this is the worst when this happens, but Kiwi essentially has gone from worst to first here over the last handful of sessions, um, pulls it back into the middle of the range and just makes a messy chart. I don't know what you'd do with that. It's sort of, you know, do we buy it? No, probably not. Do we short it? Probably not, and so forth. So you can just see Kiwi, which had been the weakest of the risk on, now the strongest. CAD, which had been the strongest, now the weakest. Those are nasty reversals when those things happen. Bitcoin and crypto, as we've been discussing, is in this downward channel, and the path of least resistance should continue to be to the downside. That is still happening. Um, I made a, a call back here that gold and, and Bitcoin and silver and all these things were had created an exhaustion high, a false breakout here that was likely to see a pretty deep correction. Do I continue to maintain a negative outlook? I would say yes, but the the majority of this correction that I would have anticipated has now played out in some of those so it's a little tougher sledding but still looks like 
the path of least resistance would be to the downside. But notice the lack of correlation. The U.S. dollar has fallen off, and yet gold can't catch a bid. Bitcoin can't catch a bid. Those are what we call market tells. It's sort of like if you were playing in a poker game, you're trying to read your opponent and trying to gather information that's not publicly available. You just have to be smart enough or whatever to identify it at the poker table. Well, here are the same thing. If gold can't go up as the dollar's been hit hard the last few days, I suspect we're going to see a, a nice, quick, swift drop to the downside in the gold and precious metal markets. I, I would put Bitcoin and things with that. Now, at the end of that big spike lower, I think we'll come and talk next week about this big drop and say, well, it did what, what we thought it would do. The market tell was a pretty good tell. It will be choppy here over the next few minutes, as it always is, but certainly I would be leaning towards the downside. Now let's look at some dollar pairs. Dollar's just tough. I mean, I wish I could pound the table and say there's a great setup, but do you trust the breakdown? Do you think that this is just a big sell-off that's worth buying? Boy, it's it's tough sledding here. I don't know. It's just in this mess of of stuff. So if we were to consider a few different options, dollar against the yen, dollar against the Swiss franc, euro USD. I mean, Euro USD has been on a, a tear to the upside. The, the longer term trend still looks down, but these corrections are pretty normal, pretty, you know, pretty ho-hum. So you finally come up to maybe a spot where Euro USD could encounter some trouble. Uh, it's pretty easy to go up that much because, again, you just think about it, you drop a lot, you come up a little, I would tend to think Euro USD is more of a short for the very short term, but we'll see. Pound USD, if you wanted to short US dollar, you probably buy pound USD. I mean, that thing just continues to work. Aussie, I wouldn't trust this breakout. Notice the difference. Do you like Aussie's breakout? No. Why? Because it's got all the this overhead supply. But... If we compare it to pound USD, if you're going to buy a breakout, I think you go pound. Why? No overhead supply. See how we're up above all of it. This is where this thing could fly. Now, perhaps both of them work, but pound USD to me is just such a better trade, such a better opportunity than Aussie USD um, most of the time. It won't happen that that works you know, 100%. But I'd say six or seven times out of 10, pound USD is going to go up a lot more than Aussie USD in those situations. And then Kiwi, again, got no real interest. So I really think there's two possibilities, maybe long pound USD or short Euro USD. And of those two, if we think about it, this one is a short USD trade, and this one is a long USD trade. And I personally lack conviction on which way the US dollar is going to go or should go. I'm just not quite sure. So those would be the ideas just from a technical standpoint. Now, if we come in a little shorter term, I mean, pound USD still looks like a breakout across shorter time periods. Maybe if you like the short USD idea, you buy the dip or something. If we go to Euro USD, whoops, and we work our way in on the 12 hour, not so much a short, the four hours not, the one hour, you know, the problem with shorting Euro USD is you just don't have a downtrend of any sort. So that sort of eliminates that one from consideration. Pound USD fits across all different time periods on the long side. So to me, it's the only one that we can really consider right here, right now. It's the only one that, that really has a chart that works across various time periods. On the daily chart is breaking out. On the 12 hour, 
breaking out. On the four hour, already broken out, may give us a pullback. On the one hour, same type of idea. Maybe there's a little dip and we can fade or, or buy to have a little bit of a fade and a rally back or something like that. But we'll see. I mean, ultimately, this is the pair, though, that I think would be most interesting because, again, I just lack conviction on USD and Euro USD is finally at maybe a, an area where it'll stall out on the daily chart, but none of those short term charts really give you a setup because they are in screaming up trends and we don't really have interest in shorting into screaming up trends. So at this point, pound USD on the long side is what I'm going to be watching for possible ideas. Now, if I were to, to shorten up the time periods, you know, a 15 minute or a one hour chart or something like that, we're probably looking at some sort of fading of a drop. If the drop looks like it's going to rebound right back up, we would just be prepared to buy into that. If I were to look at this as a simple idea, maybe back into just kind of wicking into this big candle and then bouncing back up. It's not going to be a huge reward to risk. It's going to be a very short-term trade. But I could see buying somewhere closer to 126.65 and playing this for a move back up to 127 or a little higher, risking 20 pips to make 40 or 50. You know, something along those lines is probably where I would be leaning, um, which ultimately means for pound USD to come down here, you'd have to see the dollar rally. The dollar should rally, in theory, uh, as a knee-jerk reaction when they don't hike, right? When they keep rates unchanged, maybe we'll see this drop down, but if it sort of lacks energy and sort of lacks that aggressiveness, then we've got an opportunity. And it looks like we're hitting the announcement here. Again, I'm gonna draw in that line. There's your drop, okay? So that's kind of an energy drop. Um, I would be inclined, though, to think that that thing's coming right back up. Give it just a, a tad here and see. So there was some initial buying in there. And I've got it on my other screen. See if it drops down. I mean, this would be the area right here where I think you could take a, take a look at it and possibly take an action on it in this 126 you know 50 ish area might be interesting kind of I thought it would come into this zone and you know I'm gonna take a stab at it right here at 126.57 just putting in a stop 20 pips below and not risking much now if it breaks this area, 126.37, will have a quick stop out. But I think this is an interesting risk to reward for just kind of a fade back up here. It might be asking too much too quickly, and that's certainly a possibility. Um, but these tend to have a quick, you know, whatever the reaction is, they fade quickly. And then... You also see a little bit later, a little bit more delayed move that can sometimes happen as well. But here, you know, that one's continuing to kind of grind its way lower. You can see there's just some continued selling and some continued selling. Let's come back into Forex Factory and see what happened. So they did keep the Fed funds rate unchanged. The statement must have been perceived as more hawkish, I suppose because you're seeing US dollar continue to climb. Um, we're coming back up. You can see the, the fading that we talked about back up into this area. Um, this is where we should start to spike back up to that zone. So if you don't hold here, I mean, this is where also you could start to raise that stop loss and just move it up. Because I don't think if it doesn't hold right in here that we want to be in this much longer. So I would probably start to, to tighten up that stop and I'm going to do so myself. And if it comes back down 
for me, it's just at 126.44 right there. If it get, goes back and touches that again, uh, well, I'll be out of the trade. But this should work its way back up here. At this point, we're only risking like 10 pips or whatever it is in the trade. So there's not a lot of risk, not a lot of reward potential in it. But that's you saw where it started to rebound back up and have that fading. That's where it should have taken off. And it's just not doing so. So I'm not very optimistic, frankly that this is going to have what it takes for this trade to be successful. And it just hit me out. So I'm out of the trade at, at a, uh, 12 pips. 12 pips, not a big deal, but raised up the stop. Again, I've traded these enough times to know that you could see the reaction. You could see that jump all the way back up here. And that's where it needed to climb. If it came back in... Again, there's just the probability of success is greatly reduced. Let's go look at a couple other markets here. If we look at gold, see that drop? See that deterioration? I mean, I think, again, if gold can't go up when dollar was, was having a rough week, it's just, I mean, as U.S. dollar goes up, it's still trading poorly. As it goes down, it's trading poorly just kind of tells you it's a heavy market. There's more sellers than buyers. It's just weighed down. It also has competition. When you're looking at gold markets, you have to think about interest rates. I can go put some money in treasuries and get 5% plus per year. Well, why own gold that's just a big shiny metal? It yields nothing. It produces no income. So the only way to succeed with gold is to actually have the price increase. And its price is less likely to increase when it has real competition and real rates and so forth. So it's just a tough environment. I know a lot of people love gold and love Bitcoin and those things. They're a better philosophical investment when rates are down at zero, essentially, because now it has no competition. You can't get yield anywhere else anyway. So why not take a shot on gold or Bitcoin's upside? Now you can get real yield other places and you start stacking 5% here, 5% there, 5% there. Gold has to go up and has to appreciate in value because if it's just doing nothing, you're losing. If it's going down, you're losing big. And if it goes up, it still has to go up by more than 5% to make it a worthwhile investment. So you got to get 10%. 15% type of price appreciation per year for it to really be justified and may not be the environment for it. So I, I suspect we're just going to continue to bleed off in those, those areas of the market. Um, yeah, we can look. So Euro USD as a potential kind of fade. I suppose that was the, the right trade today would just be playing that short euro usd but i didn't have frankly a lot of conviction i always love the markets when i can come in pound the table you know i'll stick my neck out there with you and say i really feel high conviction for this or for that uh, the best trade right now in my eyes is probably that gold short you want to make some money just shorting gold probably is the way to go so thanks again everyone hope you enjoyed today's uh, midweek, not too much happening, just kind of choppy markets, but that's the good thing about markets. They come and go, and sometimes there's a lot of pitches to swing at. Sometimes, like right now, there's just not as much that you can really sink your teeth into. So keep looking for those opportunities. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, everyone.